Good morning, everyone. We're in 1 Samuel 19. So we've been discussing the erratic behavior of Saul toward David and how he's going back and forth so much in uh, how he's going to treat him, whether he's trying to honor him and keep him close or whether he's trying to, to banish or kill him, uh, really kill him. Um, and what we left off with last week was how uh, David ends up marrying the daughter of Saul after two attempts to make that happen. Uh, so it's the younger daughter that now marries him. And he is, does not fall victim to Saul's plan of trying to put him into extreme danger so that he will just die in the attempt to prove his worth. Uh, he shouldn't have even had to prove his worth, considering that this was already the reward for him uh, killing Goliath. But David uh, is very successful in battle. God has been with him, uh, and he's able to be quite successful against the Philistines. We also talked about David and Jonathan last week and the, the kind of friendship and closeness that they had with each other, uh, that they are committed to each other, and even more importantly, Jonathan is siding with David, not with his father, and not really even with himself. Uh, you would expect that David and Jonathan would be bitter rivals, considering that uh, Jonathan is the expected next king of Israel, but David is the one that God has chosen to be the next king of Israel. But Jonathan is not going to challenge him, is not going to, uh, to make an enemy of David at all. He is committed to him and is also asking for David to uh, have that same level of commitment back to him in keeping his family safe. Uh, and so this is a very interesting kind of relationship to see from them, uh, but also important that Jonathan does not put up a fight in going against the will of the Lord. That can only be true because he has that much faith in God and that much respect for God's judgment on the matter. Okay, so chapter 19, we see that even though literally right before uh, that David has just married Michael, uh, he has been highly esteemed by the entire nation. Chapter 19 begins with, and Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. So Saul is not going to try to come up with a, a secret plan or some way to indirectly kill David anymore. This is more overt. Let's find a way to kill him. Uh, and he's not afraid to talk about it with his own house, his, his servants, and even with Jonathan. There seems to be the assumption on Saul's part that, that Jonathan's going to go along with this. Uh, I think mostly because of the way that uh, David, that John, excuse me, that Saul responds later um, in assuming that Jonathan's going to consider David as an enemy. Uh, again, that's what you would expect him to do. But Saul does not make any attempt to hide this from Jonathan. Uh, he believes that Jonathan's going to be an active partner in this. But what does Jonathan do when this plan is, is beginning to be formed? He goes and tells David. I mean, yeah. uh, he doesn't keep it a secret. He doesn't keep this to himself and stuff like that. Well, whatever my father was going to do, stuff like that. He actually warns him. Yeah. So not only is Jonathan not an active part of whatever plan Saul is coming up with, he's not even the you know the passive bystander. He's going to go and to warn David and say. You're in trouble. You need to be on guard. You need to find a secret place to hide uh, and let me figure out what's going on and see just how much danger you're in. See if I can, can dissuade my father from doing this. So, uh, that, yeah, verse 3. I, I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. So Jonathan's going to make an attempt to uh, convince his father not to kill David 
I'm going to try to do it within the hearing of David so that uh, David can, can hear with his own ears how much danger he's really in. Um, why do you think that might be, uh, might be a good idea or might be necessary here? He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to take his word for it. Yeah. Yeah, this, um, the, it's kind of a scary situation of knowing that people are plotting against you and trying to think, who can I trust? Maybe Jonathan is telling me, but not really telling me. Maybe he's a part of this. Maybe he's uh, you know, playing some elaborate game. We've also seen J David a little bit uh, hesitant to actually believe that Saul would really kill him. Um, that's uh, a couple times throughout these chapters, David seems to want to believe the best and want to believe that there's, there's no real danger in this or that everything's going to be okay. Um, and I get the idea that Jonathan is having to convince David a little bit. Um, you really are in danger, um, and I need you to hear it with your own ears. So, okay. So, uh, Jonathan and Saul are talking, and Jonathan is going to speak well of David. That's verse 4. Spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? What's Jonathan's argument here for Saul? What's Jonathan's argument here for to Saul to not kill David? I have a long time last night. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Well, he's done nothing but good for you. He hasn't done anything against you. And if you kill him, it's murder. You know, you're going to be doing wrong. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, saying, look at the facts here. David hasn't done anything wrong. David is not worthy of death. Look at all the good that he's done for you. Maria, did you have your hand up? Yeah. I did also. I think sometimes us with God even, we forget the things he does for us and how he saves us through things. Here, I think even Saul, I don't know, Saul has blinders a lot of times, could think he had forgotten what a huge thing that was. How they were all scared. He was scared of Goliath. The men were scared of him. And yeah, how do you think that story ends if David doesn't show up? Like, there, things are rapidly, you know, escalating to, to a disaster in that with each passing day, the people are getting more afraid, nobody is willing. You know that morale is being flushed down the toilet as they're, as they're all hearing Goliath say this day after day. Well, they were commanded to go out and, and like, kill the Philistines and stuff like that, so uh, that's one thing. But they were also, you know, one of the Ten Commandments was, thou shalt not kill. Yeah. And so Jonathan is bringing this to Saul's attention, you know. Yeah. He's not done anything wrong. You kill him, it's murder. Yeah. Right, so Saul has no justification for killing David, even though he has the capability to do so as king. Uh, sometimes we get a little bit locked into what is possible, like uh, he is actually able to do it, and not what is right and what he is actually justified in doing. Uh, so Jonathan's trying to snap Saul out of it, of, you know, don't do this irreversible thing that you want to do that will be sin and will, will victimize an innocent man. It's a good argument. It's exactly what needs to be said there. Uh, because David does not need to be put to death. He does not need to be killed in some fit of anger. Uh, this, there's, there's no reason to do any of that. So does Saul listen? He does. He does. Yeah, at least initially he does. Um, and that's verse 6. He listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Does anybody find that as interesting as I do, that Saul says, as the Lord lives, kind of invoking the name of God in this? 
Saul's not real connected with God here in, in these chapters. Uh, he's not all that concerned with doing the will of God, but at the same time, he is happy to invoke the name of God when he believes that now this is the right thing to do. Just sort of a weird choice from him. Aaron? No, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, his um, attitude is, you know, he swears this. Yeah. But if he didn't hold the Lord in some sort of disregard or contempt, later on he wouldn't keep trying to kill David. Right. Because he goes against his own oath. Yeah, does his oath mean anything to him? I, I, I don't think it does. And therefore, the name of God doesn't mean anything to him because now he's brought God into this. He's you know, sworn by, by God in heaven uh, Jesus later warns about that, right? Uh, of trying to invoke the name of God when you're swearing an oath and how silly that is, for one. Um, but also, like, really now he's even disparaging God, not just going against uh, like a promise to Jonathan. Oh. Well, it's interesting how he doesn't say, as the Lord lives, I shall not kill. Mm -hmm. He says, he shall not be killed. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, his promise was actually kept. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's true, and that's interesting that that it ends up kind of working out that way. Um, but Saul is not uh, not working to keep his oath because he is certainly trying to break it. Uh, and this is just another example, I feel, of Saul kind of bouncing all over the place, going from. You know, I love David and let's make him my armor bearer and he's a hero of Israel to I'm so jealous of him and the people love him more than me and now I need to kill him. To, you know, let's, let's give him my daughter as this reward and give him this very public honor, but let's do it in a way that maybe he'll just go ahead and die so that he can be the hero and the martyr, but I don't have to worry about him. It, it's just back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, he, it was pretty evident. He was just using the name of God. Yeah, it's, this is it's just all over the place. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't actually know like how much time exactly passes sure. between the oath and then his change of heart. I mean, we do know that there's David's back. He's, it's kind of as it was before. There's another war. Yeah. They're victorious. There is some time that passes, uh, but yeah, then you know Saul has another you know evil spirit, you know, uh, depression, yeah. anxiety, more more stress, whatever, sure. and then yeah, he's back back to trying to remove David from the picture. Yeah. That's a good point to bring up, and sometimes we, we have a hard time with the sense of scale and time when we're just reading through these events like this. We do it in the Gospels, too, you know, as if everything Jesus did happened in a single week or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, some time does pass here. Saul makes this oath. Things do seem to go back kind of to normal. There's some more fighting, so, like, more than a few days has passed for sure can't say exactly how long it's been, um, but enough time for David to go back out into battle to be successful, to have some kind of restoration into Saul's court. Uh, he's there uh, and expected to be there. Things are a little bit back to normal. All of this makes it easier for Saul to ignore his oath. All of it makes it easier for him to uh, to change his mind that, okay, we're going to kill David again. The, the problem with this, and, and part of the reason why the, the, uh, the author of Samuel condenses all of this down is to show kind of that stark contrast. We're kind of deliberately squeezing the events together so that the contrast is very strong between Saul's oath and then a short time later trying to kill David again. So it wasn't the next day. I don't think he was even lying to Jonathan. I think Saul probably meant what he said or believed he meant what he said when he made that oath, but 
he's you know god is not with him and his anxiety and paranoia and whatever is going on with saul uh, is just going to continue okay so yes david goes out to war again verse eight uh, he's wildly successful against the philistines he has no problem in defeating them time and time again and you got to frame all of this with the knowledge that the Philistines were the scourge of the Israelites. They historically have not been that successful against them. Uh, they historically have been, been uh, kind of under the, the feet of the Philistines, uh, which is why Israel wanted Saul as king in the first place. But every time David goes out into war against them, he's successful. He kills their champion. He, he finds success over and over in these battles because God is with him. And that is our recurring theme as we go. God is with David. God is not with Saul. Uh, so as Aaron mentioned, verse 9, the harmful spirit from the Lord comes upon Saul. This is going to be the same thing. We talked about this last time, or at least a couple weeks ago maybe. Um, on what exactly that harmful spirit could be, some level of distress or anxiety or paranoia or a combination of things, whatever it is that is afflicting Saul, uh, it rears its head again here. And that's tied, I believe, to David's success. And that goes along with what he's, with what the pattern has been before. As David excels, Saul becomes afraid. It's a matter of jealousy and a matter of fear that David is going to exceed him and that the people are going to choose David over him and over Jonathan as well. So every time that David's doing well is kind of when this paranoia gets worse. So David is playing the liar in Saul's court, apparently still has some duties as a kind of a court musician, even though he's also a commander and armor bearer. Um, and what does Saul do here? Tries to kill him, throws the spear at him. Yeah, tries to kill him. Uh, yeah. Tries to strike him with the spear. The, the spear goes into the wall. David is able to avoid it. Uh, and he flees and escapes that night. So this is, well, previously we were told that, David, that Saul tried to kill David twice. And we were given one of those. I kind of read that as this is the second one then. But depending on how you want to read that, this is either the second or the third time that Saul has tried to uh, kill David in some fit of rage or, or whatever here, uh, and David is through. <laughs> he, he runs, he gets out of the king's house, uh, and he is trying to get away from Saul. So, what's Saul's next move? Because so oh, yeah, messengers to the house to watch David and the order is to kill him in the morning. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little bit different than what we saw before. Previously, Saul had whatever fit of rage overtake him, throw a spear at David, and uh, then the moment is kind of over, right? The moment's not over. Saul's still angry. Saul is still uh, determined to kill David. And so he, he's pressing this and continuing this uh, in that he, they're trying to hunt David down, find him, kill him. They've got his house surrounded. They're watching. As soon as David makes himself known, they're going to kill him. Now, David clearly knows this. He's there in that house. Uh, and Michael, his wife, is, is going to try to convince him that he's got to flee, he's got to get farther away. He can't stay there in their home. So she says, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So she does not have many blinders on. She understands the danger and knows that her father has every intent to kill David. This is not going to blow over. Yeah, yeah it sounds like she's 
um, not on her father's side either. Right. If she was wanting Jonathan, or you know, if, if she was wanting the king to stay in Saul's family, if she might not have told her husband. It's like, well, right. you know, but she she loved her husband. She told her husband it didn't work. Yeah, kind of interesting how um, people aren't really, you know, Saul's family isn't on his side. Uh, that his, you know, he, he's very willing to talk to his servants, talk to Jonathan uh, about how he's going to kill David. Um, but there's not as much buy-in as you would expect. Sure, the servants are going to do what they're told to do. They're servants and they probably don't feel they have much choice in the matter. Um, don't know everything that's going on and don't know, uh, you know, whether David has really done something to deserve death or not. They're going to obey the orders that they're given. But the people who know better, the people who are closer uh, to Saul and closer to the whole situation recognize, hey, this isn't right. Jonathan's not going to play ball with it. Michael's not going to play ball with it even though they both stand to gain a lot if they do cooperate with Saul. Um, it's, it, it's in their interests to do so, yet they have no desire to. Uh, so between that and between how the servants have noted Saul's erratic behavior and they're trying to find some ways to calm him down and to uh, kind of alleviate his distress, we get the picture that everyone's looking at Saul with a wary eye of, what is wrong with the king? Well, he is not behaving in a just or right or sane way. He's not acting like you would expect a king to act. This is not a mighty man of valor. This is not a man who's serving God. This is a man who's out of control and who's making bizarre choices. Okay, so Michael's not going to cooperate with it. Uh, she is fully siding with David. So how does David get away, and what is the scheme here? Ben. curious about the image too. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, a few things here. One, you can make a movie out of this, this whole scene. <laughs> okay. uh, this is like dramatic and wild how this goes down. And this is like not what you would expect the, you know, future king of Israel to have to go through. Like this is kind of a, a low moment for David to have the indignity of, of literally having to climb out the window and run for his life. Um, but also, it, it's just kind of astounding the depths they have to go to, the lengths they have to go to, I mean, to, uh, to, to get David safe and to try to buy him some time. So yeah, Michael takes this image, and my translation says image as well, um, and some of the uh, translations say something a little bit different. But what we mean by that, if you haven't caught on, is like a household idol. Okay? So there are some questions that come up with that. Why does Michael have a household idol? Uh, and you know, this is so readily accessible, she doesn't really have to like go and find one somewhere in Israel. She has one. So it's hard for me to believe that David is worshiping a, you know, these idols and that uh, this is done with uh, you know, David's involvement and consent. Uh, we've seen nothing but a, a pure faith in God from David, uh, no indication that he is worshiping idols or has kind of a, a divided heart in any way. But this wouldn't be the first time that we've seen a wife of a, you know, a, a man of faith hide or secretly keep a household god. Can anyone remember a similar story in the Old Testament that happened before this? Rachel, 
Rachel, yes. She secretly has her father's household idol. Uh, now hers seems to be a great deal smaller than what whatever Michael has, uh, because when she wants to hide it, she is able to uh, kind of you know put it under a tent, you know bury it under a tent and able to sit on it. Whereas Michael's uh, is something that when you put it in a bed could be mistaken for the shape of, a, of David, of a human adult male. So probably not gonna be able to hide this by sitting on it, right? Uh, but she's not trying to hide it anyway at this point. She's using it in this scheme. So I believe this is likely Michael's rather than David's or theirs together. Uh, and I think it's hers and not something she just found because where could she have gone to go get this? If she didn't already have it in, in their own house, you know, how, when the house is surrounded and being watched, did she, you know, go to the neighbors and try to find one that's, I don't know, I have a hard time seeing that. Jeff? Yeah, mine says image instead of an idol and stuff like that. And that put a thought in my mind, could it have been something like, you know, back during the time, you know, uh, people um, carved images and stuff like that, you know, picture, you know, like you see bust of, you know, people's heads and stuff like that. Could it have been something simple as a, a decoration of some a family member or something like that, maybe, you know? Just that an idea. Yeah, so I think this word in particular is specifically for a more of a religious image, for more of a household god, is um, everything that I can see <coughs> on it. You're right, it is sort of a generic uh, you know, word image there, um, but used in a way that is, is consistent with these household gods. Well, she didn't treat it very reverentially. That's true. You could have to throw it in the bed, put some goat hair on it, and use it as a common object, basically. She does, which adds a little bit more intrigue to the whole thing. She, she doesn't go and pray to it for David to be kept safe. She does use it like this. That's interesting. Mark? Yeah, the, the whole thing about idolatry, I think there's certain levels of it that we not privy to, I think, uh, like what Jeff is trying to say, it may have been just an image. Uh, there are indications that even during the time of David's reign, they had groves which were religious. Yeah. Uh, that's idolatry as well. And it was just so ingrained into the culture that it wasn't a big deal to have one of those in your house. And uh, that's, that's more of a... Uh, an indication of what was going on with the people in general. Mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether or not anybody was worshiping this idol, saying right. it's a god, and it's, and it's just another god with the other gods, we don't know. Right. But it was just one of those things. Idolatry was so infiltrated from the time of even coming out of Egypt. Yeah. The, the, the Israelites were infiltrated with idolatry throughout all of their history. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so that is a, a pretty plausible explanation for why this is there. Uh, when we combine the way we see all this used, you know, it isn't really used reverentially. It isn't used in a way that you expect a, you know, a household god or idol to be used. Um, I did just double check and look up that word, that word teraphim. Uh, is specifically for household gods like this. So um, no, no real chance that this is an image of something else, you know, a, a carving of a family member or anything like that. Um, but even still, that doesn't necessarily make it that much easier to understand. It is kind of a weird thing to be here um, because it's a little bit of a surprise that we suddenly see it, you know, on the scene and used in this unusual way. Um, so probably, most likely, we're dealing with something like what Mark is talking about. It's around, it hasn't been fully dealt with, banished, you know, uh, destroyed. It's 
one of those things that's kind of kept in the back of the closet, so to speak, um, because you know Michael hasn't fully let that go. I don't know if David knew that it was there or not. You can speculate, but it's, it's probably not super profitable to, to even try to do that. The point being is Michael has it. This is some indication of weakness. Uh, it's an indictment against Saul for his daughter to even have it and for this to be present in Israel and for Saul to not be doing something about it is an indictment against his rule and against his, his position as father. Happy Father's Day, Saul. Your daughter's got an idol <laughs> that, um, that's not supposed to be there and she should not have that just hanging around. So yeah, she doesn't seem to be actively worshiping it or actively treating it as a god, but there's some mystique around these. So, you know, sometimes the idea of, of having it present to aid in fertility, to kind of be a good luck charm for the house, they looked at it in that way. Even if you don't really worship it as a god, it's still nice to have around. It'll bless the house in some way. Well, you're dealing with a hyper superstitious culture. Mm -hmm. and we're not so far off that we don't have our rabbit's foot or sure. you know, yeah. horseshoe and you know, we, yeah. Yeah. throwing salt over your shoulder, things right. like that. You know, we do our little, which is kind of silliness. Right. Really, when people see 11, 11 on the clock or yeah. you know, there's, there's little, we still have plenty of superstition in culture, even with people who aren't of faith and yeah. Yeah, even in our enlightened age, where we're supposedly past all of that, we are, uh, we're not really past that. Uh, and it was, it was even stronger then. And, and they, they had a very open mindset of, you know, the supernatural is large and hard to explain and don't try to limit what might be out there and use whatever you might be able to use for, you know, luck, for blessing, for whatever. Uh, the, it's really hard for them to get rid of, of the idea of worshiping or trusting in anything but God. Okay. Right, yes, Kay, I'm another. Well, David was gone a lot. He was away sure. a lot. Yeah. So this could be something that she brought in while he was away and he didn't even know it was there. Yeah, easily enough. I mean, we can speculate as to you know whether David knew about it or not, and I mean, I'm I'm kind of inclined to think he didn't, but it's not impossible that he did. Uh, that you know, e even during David's reign, there are things that Israel is trying to work through, and he's not able to totally get them to banish um, everything like that from uh, the nation. So uh, there may be some some level of this hanging around, even with him. You don't know, I don't. I was just going to say when you were making the description of what people thought about this supernatural world and we have to cover your face and we have to appeal. Yeah. And it sounds a lot like the argument that I hear from some of our brethren that want it to include either other religious um, celebrations into our worship or secular celebrations into our worship. It's not something that we read about in the Bible. And one of the uh, criteria or the rationale is, well, it makes us more available to the community. So they'll feel more comfortable when they come in. Yeah. And we need to be very careful about these things creeping in ourselves. Yeah, you know, the, the idol seems strange to us because, well, you know, we don't, have household idols sitting in our closets, or do we? <laughs> but um, but the, uh, the concept of, of keeping something, of using something that's common in your culture and kind of keeping that in, as a way of, of attracting others, of covering every base, yeah, we do some things like that that we, we gotta be very, very careful of. Mark? Um, this thing was pretty big. I don't know how David couldn't have known about it. But that's beside the point. Um, but I do think the attitude towards idolatry was acceptance. Yeah. 
and because that's what we see happen. And what is more important, this is what we're seeing in the story, is their hearts towards God. David's heart towards God wasn't swayed because of his own. Yeah. We see later in the next when the when the next generation comes, he's he's affected. Solomon's affected by his seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, and he is he turns away from God. We don't see David do that. Yeah. This whole story is predicated on the point from the previous chapter that Saul recognizes that God is with David. And from that point forward, he's trying to kill him because God is not with him. And David, his heart was with God. And whether there was these, these uh, superficial outside things happening around him, it didn't sway him. That is, to me, the, the point of the story. Yeah, it, oh, for sure. And also, there's, um, th there's kind of a... a another level of the narrative of comparing like what God is able to do for David versus the usefulness of this idol in the whole story. The idol is used in kind of a deceptive scheme that buys them a few minutes. God has been with David and has, uh, has uh, given him the strength to overpower Goliath and to be successful in all these battles and to, to keep David safe in all the times that Saul is trying to kill him. You've got this, this comparison here that the idol does no great wonder to help David be safe. Aaron? What makes an image an idol? Fair point. Being worshipped, being <laughs> being used, yeah, and it is not being used in that way. So you know there are a lot of questions about why it's there and what their attitude was, uh, attitude toward it was. Um, it's it is a little bit interesting to think about, um, but the point of this story is nothing is going to sway David from serving God, and God is going to keep David safe even when Saul is trying to kill him. Maria. Yeah. Oh, instead of just saying, oh, he's not here. Yeah. That looks like it, even though they still don't win. Yeah. 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 Ye
a level of you know comedic extreme and deception to stop your father from killing an innocent man. What does that say about him? This this whole thing is not a good look for Saul. None of them trusted him. Yeah. They don't have any trust or faith in their own father. Yeah. Right, it's the, the working so hard to buy some time to calm him down, to stop him from doing this, yeah, it's a disaster. So what does David then do? Because now he's made it out the window. We've been sticking around with uh, Saul and Michael, but what's David doing? Goes to Samuel. Okay, goes to Samuel. Kind of... I guess the natural thing, where do you go at this point when the king is looking for you? Well, we've got somebody else who's on uh, the bad side of the king, yet on the good side of God. And so that's a fairly natural person for David to go to. Uh, David's going to go to Samuel and to try to find some safety and refuge there. Uh, and this, um, this Naoth here is kind of said as a place name probably more generally just means the the homes of the prophets we see samuel running what appears to be a school for lack of a better word a, a, a you know teaching prophets kind of wish we had more information about that it's an interesting thing to think about um, but there's a company of prophets who are there uh, and Samuel is said to be standing as head over them. And so they are worshiping God there together. Um, they, you know, prophesying together. And Samuel has some kind of leadership over them. Again, the story has not been focusing on Samuel uh, for some time, but he has not just disappeared. Uh, and Saul gets, gets word that David is there, and so he is continuing. We're going to still hunt David down and kill him. Saul is not going to settle down. From this point on, uh, he, well, that's not entirely true. He, he's going to settle down one more time. Um, but this is taking a lot more effort to settle down before he uh, he stops trying to kill David. This is not simply getting angry and throwing a spear and then it dying down. This is a long, drawn-out attempt, multiple attempts, to kill David. So the messengers of Saul get to the, the homes of the prophets there, and what happens when they arrive? Yeah. Well, it's kind of a humorous because you know they aren't doing this according to their own will, but they also start prophesying. Interesting. Very interesting, isn't it? Kind of start spontaneously prophesying. And yeah, they're not doing this of their own will. They're there on Saul's orders. They're there not to prophesy, but to kill David, yet here they are prophesying. God's in control of us, right? Mark, did you something add to that? Yeah, I just think it's really weird. He's sending all these people, and they're all prophesying. I, mean, it's, I never thought of uh, prophesying as being something that you unwillingly do, but it seemed to be something like they couldn't control themselves. And because they were prophesying, they couldn't bring David back to Saul. They couldn't kill him. They couldn't do anything except prophesy God's word. I'm assuming that's what it was. And it just seemed yeah. to be kind of humorous to see something like that. Yeah, that doesn't fit the, uh, the common pattern that we see for prophecy, but that's the way it's working right here and the way it seems to work sometimes. Um, yeah, sometimes we pigeonhole God a little bit too much, uh, but God always has to work in exactly one way with something. Um, there's no reason why he can't make this, this filling of the Spirit and this kind of ecstatic prophecy uh, be something that happens and it stops them in their tracks. This is his way of protecting David here. And it happens not just once, not just twice, three times. Saul is sending people here, and they just can't seem to kill David, not because they've been overpowered by all the guards surrounding David, but because they can't stop prophesying when they get there. All they can do is bring praise to God. And the fact that praise to God 
is the opposite of what Saul is trying to get them to do. Mm, a little bit of irony there, right? So then Saul goes himself. What's going to happen when Saul goes himself? Is Saul among the prophets? Is Saul among the prophets. We've heard this before, haven't we? Ah, uh, so we're bringing us full circle in that Saul, when he was, was first anointed uh, to be king, when he first uh, had God with him, he had this, this time of kind of the ecstatic prophecy again. Uh, he was not typically among the prophets, but that time he was. And so the people marveled. Is Saul among the prophets? This was a mark of God's favor. Well, this time, Saul is, just like all these messengers, he is prophesying without real control over it. And so we ask again, is Saul among the prophets? Doesn't that sound a little bit more ironic and twisted now, though? It's like Saul has been doing so much to work against God for so long that this question of is Saul among the prophets just sounds so out of character a very different twist than what it was before um, but Saul is not able to kill David and somehow and we don't get uh, a lot of information as to how it happens but things calm down from here I don't know if Samuel is able to you know mediate if if God calms Saul down if it, Saul just finally settles down because some time has passed um, because he hasn't been able to do it himself but whatever happens, by the time we end up in chapter 20, which we'll talk about next week, we see that David is expected to be at Saul's table. So there's a bit of a jump there that uh, we go from Saul hunting David down far away from home to now expected to be at his table. So yeah, Saul settles down a little bit here, but he is quickly going to be trying to kill David again. Thanks, everyone. Next week, chapter 20.